Our text tonight is in the 16th chapter of the book of Judges. Judges, the 16th chapter, reading verse 6. <clears throat> and Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. And one of the old European versions of the scripture has an extra word in this text, and the extra word is secret. So then the text reads, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein the secret of thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee want to accept that word secret <clears throat> you say it's not there by inspiration and that's true but it's there by inference anyhow and this is a question of a, a woman of the world it will be a great day and God hasten it when the world again begins to ask the church what is the secret of thy great strength I believe the world has a suspicion that the church has no strength About 400 years ago in England we had a breed of men, a very unusual breed, most Englishmen are, <coughs> but they were a very unusual breed. By any standard they were giants, morally, spiritually, intellectually. And history has classified them as a Puritan. Quite a number of them, but I think the tallest of them, theologically, spiritually, was John Owen. John Owen left, left us a massive volume on the Holy Spirit. And that isn't my interest right now. My interest is this, that he, <coughs> I mean, he criticized men this way. He said the sin of men in the Old Testament was against the Father. The sin of men in the New Testament, he said, was against the Son. And the sin of men in my day, he said, 400 years ago, is against the Holy Spirit. I think if he came back, he wouldn't need to modify that criticism in any way. I've said, I shall say tonight, say other night, that I believe that this is the most perilous hour in the history of America. In the last two or three years, I have been at the National Convention of the Southern Baptists, at the Florida State Convention, at the Texas State Convention, and at each of them I've said, I would like to give all the preachers a sheet of paper and a pencil and ask them to write on that piece of paper what or who they think is the greatest threat to America today. And I've said and still say that I don't think 10% of them could give me the right answer. They might start off with the devil and finish with the Democrats, and in between have drink and dope and I don't know what else. Divorce. But I believe the greatest threat to America tonight is God. If you haven't read any books by Francis Schaeffer, who is a full-blooded American, in one sense, I think one of the great spiritual intellectuals of our time, he's running the Liabre Fellowship there in Switzerland. It's a rescue station for intellectuals. Some kids from the richest homes in America, kids that have had the very best of everything. Their daddies own planes and yachts. They lived in millionaires' homes. They've had the finest of education, but they hit the gutter. They got caught in the vortex of modern life. And they've made their own pilgrimage there to the Abre Fellowship in Switzerland with a language something like this. Look, that's our last hope. If you don't have the answer, we can't find the answer in the churches in America. Uh, but I'm interested in this observation he makes in his book called Death in the City, which is only about a dollar and a quarter, and if you want something to upset you, read it. He says, remember this, that God has given up on the cities of America, they rejected him, and God has rejected them, on the basis of the fir first three chapters in Romans. But then he says this more disturbing thing, he says, remember that in China, 800 years ago, 8 centuries ago, Every leading town and city in China 800 years ago had a thriving evangelical church. Where is that church tonight? God said that he was married to Israel. God said he divorced Israel. God says ultimately he'll remarry Israel. 
In between, God hasn't bothered with Israel for 2,000 years. She's been the football that every nation has kicked around. Five times in history they have been almost annihilated. Bothered with Israel, the people he married for 2,000 years. What makes you think he didn't walk out on America? Or England? You don't legalize abortion. You don't take living babies out of living mothers. And where do the babies go? Mind your own business. Maybe your dog ate them this week for dog meat. And I'm not facetious. Nevada has legalized prostitution. England has legalized homosexuality. We have nine million alcoholics. We have roughly 30 million people on some kind of drugs. We have an all-time high in venereal disease amongst kids under 15 years of age this past year in America. And England is very much the same. You see, you only shake your finger at God and break his law so long and God walks out on nations. Just like he does on men, he says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. And one of the terrible things about preaching is that while some people come forward and say they'll take Christ for eternal life, there are others who say no, not openly, secretly. And that very moment they say it, they're dead. As long as God lives. Because there comes a time when God knocks at the door of the heart for the very last time, and then he goes. This story of Samson to me is a story of a superman. To me, Samson is a type of a spirit anointed man. He's a type of a spirit anointed church. The two most elusive things in the world tonight, what are they? While we've been in the Bahamas the last three years, there was a, there was a scare. There were the newspaper articles, they thought they'd rediscovered the lost island of Atlantis, but discovered they hadn't. And right now, for some reason, I don't know. There are two expeditions on the Himalayan ranges trying to find the abominable snowman. If they were trying to find the abominable showman, I could give them the names of six evangelists. <laughs> but they're trying to find the abominable snowman. Are these the most elusive things in the world? The abominable snowman and the uh, elusive lost island? No, 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 no. The two most elusive things on God's earth tonight are number one, personal anointing by the Holy Spirit, and number two, Holy Ghost revival. In every other area you can energize, organize, get money, and you just sweat in your labor when it comes to it. God won't anoint you because you're a millionaire and he won't refuse you anointing the helper. God won't send blessing because you have this gorgeous church and I think it's very beautiful. He won't bypass it either because you have it. You see, God is sovereign and there are certain things that men must do if God is going to come and bless. Type of a spirit anointed man. <clears throat> I suppose it's fortunate for mankind and that only once in maybe a thousand million men you get a man who wants to dominate the whole world. We've had a few of them in history. Remember they told you at school perhaps that Alexander the Great at 27 years of age conquered the world and sat down and wept because there were no more worlds than he knew off to conquer and he was only 27 years of age. A man in my day almost conquered the world. His name was Hitler. Prior to him, a small, corpulent, Corsican by the name of Napoleon, one of the greatest military strategists in history, almost come to the world. And one day, he gathered together his warlords. On the wall of his office, he had a great map of the world, and he snapped these men to attention, and he plunged his index finger around the right edge of the great country. And then he said to his generals, Gentlemen, there lies a sleeping giant. Let it sleep! He said this in before the Battle of Waterloo, which happened to be on June the 18th, which is tomorrow, and it's my birthday. You know where I'm staying. <clears throat> and uh, 
But on the battle day of the Battle of Waterloo, with his ambition to the world, he ran his finger around that country. There was the sleeping giant. Let it sleep! He said, if that country ever wakes up and discovers its mineral wealth and harnesses that mineral wealth for its manpower, let the rest of the world look out. That giant will shake the world. If you're interested, the country that he outlined was China. America's biggest headache tonight. Russia's biggest headache. Doesn't the book of the Revelation say somewhere around about the ninth chapter that one day 200 million men will come marching from the east? From where? Well, they don't have 200 million in Japan. The only country could be China. Do you remember you being taxed up to your ears to make atom bombs and hydrogen bombs? And wasn't it Mr. Uh, who was the president? Wasn't it uh, that Baptist president? Truman. No wonder he has many mistakes. But anyhow, <clears throat> wasn't it Truman that said after that bomb was dropped on Hiroshima or Hiroshima at 16 minutes to 8 on the 6th of August 1945, if there's another war, if the world is threatened, we'll drop the bomb the first week and get it over. There are 50,000 bodies of racist American boys in Vietnam that tell you that was a lie. You've been taxed your ears to make atom bombs. We don't use one of them. Why? Because when America dropped that bomb, as I say, at 60 minutes to 8 on the 6th of August, 1945, she had the big stick and she was telling the world what to do. But remember tonight, China, that has no conscience, has that atom bomb. You don't need aircraft. All you have to do is to make an intercontinental ballistic missile and put a warhead in it and, and shoot the thing and boy, they can blast us to smithereens. Interesting, isn't it, that Mr. Brezhnev, Leonardo Brezhnev, is going to have a political reception tomorrow with pomp and circumstance and soldiers and drums and bugles. And he hates us like the devil. And Nixon doesn't hate him much less anyhow. But we play hypocritical games. Or play. Did you nearly roll out of bed the other night? Was it Tuesday or Wednesday? They shot a thing off across the water there, one of those rockets. At 3.30 in the morning, it rocked your shots and windows. And it was a new gadget that's going around in space right now, and it's specially put there to uh, listen in for anything that Russia sends over and relay and release a message within seconds once Russia starts firing these missiles, which they know we have and we know they have. For the last 12 years, some men who are under the mountains there in Colorado have marched down under an area that's thicker than this place with concrete, and they simulate pulling a switch. They never pull the right one because it has a bit of wire on, so they want. But if they pull the right one, rockets would shoot out from all over America to blast everything in the sky. And the article I had on that says the men who are waiting for Armageddon. China's our biggest headache. Napoleon said over a century ago, century and a half, there lies a sleeping giant, let it sleep. If China ever decides to yawn and stretch and go on the march, let the world look out. All right, you don't like politics, let's change it. Instead of, see, uh, instead of seeing a map of the world, see a map of the ages. Instead of seeing Napoleon, see the devil. And he brings all the demons out of hell and he's Malaya. There, see that? <clears throat> he runs his finger around the ragged edge of something. What is it? The Church of Jesus Christ. And he says, there is the Church of Jesus Christ asleep. Let it sleep! Because if the Church of Jesus Christ ever be discovered the power of the Holy Ghost, and harnesses what it already has to the power of the Spirit. Let the earth look out and let hell look out. For the church anointed in the power of the Holy Ghost is the greatest power after the power of the triune God.
Tell me where in the secret of thy great strength I am. I first heard about America when I was a little boy in a school in England. I had a teacher I didn't like. I never had one I did like, as a matter of fact, but <clears throat> this one I particularly didn't like. She didn't like me either. I don't know why. I've always been attractive, but anyhow, she didn't like me. And she thought I didn't know much, and I knew she didn't. And she told us a story, the best known story, I don't care whether you go to Russia or Africa, wherever you go around the world, there's one story that's known above all of the stories in America, about America. You know what it is? The story of truth. I don't know whether it's a Democrat or Republican, but he's very famous. <clears throat> and she told us this man who went up a hill and he fell asleep, and when he came down the hill he got involved in argument with a group of people. All I know, she said he slept for 20 or 50 years, she wasn't sure. And that's all I learned about the man. And that's exactly what the story is, which proved her ignorance anyhow. <clears throat> you see, the story is this, that when he went up the hill, there was a sign hanging outside of the tavern. On it was painted the head of the third of England. England had a lot of money in America at that time. When he came down the hill, they had painted out the face of George the Third. And they had painted the face of another famous Englishman. Did you guess his name? George Washington. Who didn't know he was English? How ignorant can you get? But anyhow, they had erased the face of George the Third, they painted there the face of George Washington. What's the secret of the story? Is the story a secret that he went to sleep for 20 years? No! The secret is this, he slept through a revolution. And I tell you, with all the power of my being tonight, I believe that's what the Church of Jesus is doing in this very moment. Sleeping through the greatest moral, spiritual, social, economic revolution in history. And make can't hold together five more years, nor can mankind, none of the present systems that we have. A week tonight, I'm going to preach, God willing, on the second coming. The king is coming. Tomorrow night, I want to preach on revival praying. Tuesday night, I believe, on vision. Wednesday night, if the Lord gives us permission, on the judgment seat of Christ. Thursday night, maybe on the cross. Friday, on problems in the Christian life. Saturday night, There'll be no preachers unless these boys do it. I'm not preaching twice a day every day. <laughs> so six days shalt thou labor, and they've all me already put me on for Saturday morning. That could cost you a thousand dollars, but that's all right. <laughs> and in case you are giving me anything this week, let me tell you this, you'll give me all that you can because I won't take a penny of it. I've got three sons on the mission field, I've got one that needs money right now, whatever comes in this church, even if you give me $10,000, I give every penny, I'll take any expenses out for eating or traveling or anything. It's all going to missions, so you and I won't get a dime. All right. The woman asked the question, what is the secret of thy great strength? Abnormal days demand abnormal men with abnormal methods and abnormal messages. And Samson is one of the most abnormal men in the Bible. You know, we, we got this man kind of mixed up in our thinking. Wherever you find a picture of Samson, you'll find him a kind of colossus. You know, he's got muscles like watermelons and muscles on his chest like a range of mountains. And that's exactly what he was. not Of course, we've read mythology. Maybe you have. Read about us carrying the world on his back. Hercules kicking a range of mountains over. Or if you're not so well educated, Jack and the Beanstalk. Let me come down to your level. <coughs> but every man is Irish. He's a Hercules. He's a Colossus. Now, I don't think women are stupid. 
always. Uh, can you imagine a woman looking up to a man 19 feet? You see, here's a picture. Here is the average man in Israel. And here is Saul, head and shoulders above the average man. And here is Goliath, head and shoulders above an animal's taller than the rest of them. And here is, Gil here is the cloth of Samson up there. Now, you can't imagine a woman going to a man and saying, uh, I say, buddy, what's the secret of your grace? pretty obvious that you'd think of that. I, I'm not going to suggest you as no bigger than the, the staff here, that wouldn't be right. <laughs> but, but by the same token, I don't think he was six feet six or six foot seven. He was a normal man doing abnormal things and everybody asked the question. You lock him up in a city, cut his half the city away with him. He meets a lion and destroys it. Two thousand men come from West Point. He picks up the job of an ass and slays them. When I said in one meeting, the Lord doesn't use the job of an ass anymore, one of those nasty little ladies on the front seat said, yeah, he, he does at our church every Sunday. <clears throat> but the job of an ass, uh, well, 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 why are you so sure he wasn't a giant? I always thought he, I had a Bible and it has a picture of Samson. He's a huge man. I'll tell you why. Because the sign is written outside of your church there, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Again, the word of God says, the lame take the prey, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Again, the word of God says, he takes the things that are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. It is a normal man doing abnormal things. He is an embarrassment to his enemies. He is a very epitome, he is a very answer to that text that says that when you are walking in the Spirit, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Or that in all things we are more than conquerors through him. You see, over and over and over again it says in his life, the most precious thing you can say of any man this side of it, and I would rather have this than you give me a check for ten billion dollars tonight. For it says before ever this man does what nobody else could do. It says of him the Spirit of the Lord rested mightily upon him, and you can't get done by college or seminary. It's still God's prerogative to give it to those who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and so desperate. But they'll do what this man did at the end of the story and find out. The woman says, what is the secret of thy great strength? What do you have that nobody else has? What's the mystery? Where do you have this energy, this supernatural power? You see, the church began by being supernatural. She's ending by being superficial. She began in the upper room with a bunch of men agonizing, and she's ending in the supper room with a bunch of women organizing. The world doesn't ask us this question anymore, does it? What is the secret of thy great strength? He gives the answer, he says, if you fasten me, verse 7, if you fasten me with seven green widths that were never dried, then I shall be like another man. No, I wish he did say that, he didn't. <laughs> what did he say? He said, if you fasten me with some of those vines that cry and climb around the trees, if they're green and they're not brittle, strap me up with them. And if you fasten me with seven green whips, I shall be a regular. No, 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 he doesn't say that. He says, then I shall be weak like other men. You know, the greatest curse of modern Christianity is that there are too many of us that are too much alike. We settle for normality. Oh, we reach for the stars in business. A fellow says, I'm not going to sit behind this desk all the time. I'm going to own the business. A fellow goes to university and says, I want to graduate with honors. The athlete will give all his time. Look at that fellow Mark Spitz. Oh, yes, he may be earning five million. He has his own yacht and everything now. But I notice he says for the last four years particularly, eight years in all, I spent no less than eight hours in the water every day. I was determined. I do what no other man did. And I tell you this for nothing, an experience of God that costs nothing, is worth nothing, it does nothing. If you're going to get this anointing by the Holy Ghost, then keep it. You'll have to wade through blood and fire to get it, and you'll have to face hell to keep it after you've got that anointing. For the devil doesn't fear organizing, he fears agonizing. 
He doesn't mind our brilliance, our genius, our intellectual power. He fears that somehow we link our impotence to our omnipotence. And that won't cost you a penny except a broken heart. It may cost some of you boys a few silly hours with your girlfriends. The other night God moved on that church in Merritt Island and many young people came for Maybe 60 people came out one night. There was a moonlight madness sail. And the lady with us at the time, they wanted to get some bargains. We went along. This young lady came up to me breathless in the mall there. And she said, Brother Raven, the devil's doing all he can to keep me from praying. I met a lady the next day. And she said, you know, just met one of our young kids, a girl 16, that trusted God to fill her with the Spirit last night, and she went home and prayed the whole night through at 16 years of age. Does that sound foreign to you? A 16 never did that. And the boy 17, he said, Reagan, this is the first time in my life I've invited the Holy Ghost to take full control of my life. And then another teenager joyously, and he says, My, this is transformed. God has come into my life as never before. I went to get a hair trim the other day. Doctor, I got me. As we came out, my wife and I met a fine-looking man. He said, Brother Raven, man, he said, I could shout and leap down this mall. I've been looking for answers. And I found the answer to spiritual power and anointing this week. I'm a new man. I'm energized by the Spirit of God. Fasten me with seven green lips. They fasten me, he gets up. That's not the secret. No, he says, fasten me with seven new ropes. And they pass him and he gets out. Because he said, if you fasten me with ropes, i will be weak like those other guys around here. But they fasten him, he gets out. Now, he did have to wear long hair. He was a Nazarite. A Nazarite had three things incumbent upon him. He could not drink wine, a sign of worldly pleasure. He could not touch anything dead, a sign of people who were dead in trespasses and in sin. He could not have his hair cut. Now, just having long hair isn't the secret of power. If it was, many of our churches would explode. <clears throat> no, no, it's not a case of long hair. What's the secret? Somebody asked me that in the office. I'll tell you what the secret is of the Christian life for tonight, next night, every night of your life. Trust and obey. There's no other way. I don't care if you go to theological seminary, cemetery, seminary or... <clears throat> I don't care how much learning you have, the whole secret is this, trust and obey, there's no other way. Whatsoever he says to you, do it! When I was youth leader in the church I went to, we had a tremendous time. We had many people say, we had fantastic meeting. And I remember asking God to take full control of my life, but it meant parting company with girlfriends and boys. All you've read about Sherwood Forest and the fellow that used to go around there, Robin Hood, well, I didn't go robbing anybody. I went in the Sherwood Forest to pray at night. Took my mother's little pedigree dog. I walked over the golf links. I got down onto the wild bracken, the wild fern. I got up in the mornings, particularly Sundays. And while everybody else slept, I went across into the forest, got under the bushes and prayed. And if I've had any secret in my life, the only thing I know is that I've given God time, all the time I could, to talk to me as well as me to talk to him. Fastening with ropes? No. Fastening with weeds? No. Unlock my hair and fasten it to a beam, and then when uh, you get my hair fastened there, I'll, I'll, I'll be powerless. And they did that, and he shook his head and nearly pulled the house down. And then she said, now that's not the secret, and he said no. And you know what she did? It's an old trait women have if they can't get their own way. <laughs> she pulled these stops out. You know what she said? You don't love me. And of course he said, oh yes I do. Oh yes, I'll tell you what my secret is. My secret is I'm a Nazarite. I've kept every vow that God has asked me. I haven't touched wine. I haven't touched anything dead. I haven't had my hair cut. And with the instinct that women have, she knew right there she got his secret. Now she had said repeatedly to him, the Philistines will be upon thee. 
Do you know that you can cut this man's life down into three simple things? First, what did they do? They bind him. Secondly, what? They blabbed Thirdly, bind him. Put him in the basement and make him tread round and round and round and round and round. Binding clowns for the Philistine. But wait a minute. There's something else. If Samson is a type of the spiritual man, and I'm persuaded he is, if Samson is a type of the spirit anointed church, and I'm sure he is, then look at the chapter, it says that he was going to Timnath. Now he could go that way to Timnath, or that way. Didn't make any difference, the road was just as short, because he was going to see his girlfriend. The road's never long when you're going to see her. <coughs> but he must not go that way. Why not? Because there's a lion in the way. <coughs> Now, if Samson is a type of a spirit-anointed person, the lion must be a type of the devil, who goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And when Samson went down the road, the lion thought, boy, my, I'm going to have a good lunch today. Look at this fellow coming. I'm just going to tear him up. And Samson thought the same thing. He's going to tear the lion up. He had his mother and father with him, and he said, Mummy, Daddy, would you sit round the corner? I've just got a little bit of business to do. And when they went round the corner, he took hold of the lion as though it were a kid of the goats, and he ripped it apart, and he threw it down. Now that's wonderful, but the next statement in the verse is more wonderful. It says that after he destroyed the lion, he said nothing about it. I'm sure a woman couldn't have done it like that, but anyhow. Samson destroyed the lion and, and, and he said nothing about it. Oh, if we'd destroyed the lion, we'd have photographed it. We'd have stretched it out, it would be the longest, strongest, heaviest, fiercest, terriblest in the whole world. And I killed it all by myself. He slew a lion. He pushed the devil back and he said nothing about it. I'm looking for a revival, and I'm sure it's coming. A Holy Ghost tidal wave that's going to engulf the whole world, and we're going to have such a, a revival that no man will steal the glory. He slew the lion. Let me ask you a simple question. Not so simple. All right. Do you push the devil around, or does he push you around? When I was in Australia, a lady said to me after one service, Mr. Raymill, I've had a terrible day today. I said, you look. I've never seen a more miserable face. Mr. Raymill, do you know what happened today? I said, no, I couldn't guess. When I got out of bed this morning, the devil was standing on the rug at the side of my bed, and he's never left me all day. I said, lady, how conceited can you get? After all, if the devil's been in your home all day, he hasn't been anywhere else in the world. Satan can't be in two places at the same time. God can, Satan can't. Demons might be. He might have sublet certain areas, but, but Satan can't. I looked her straight in the eye and I said, lady, you say Satan's been with you all day. I seriously doubt he even knows you're living. Does he know you're living? I got saved when I was 14 years of age. I never doubted it, never been ashamed of it, talked around the world about it. And according to this book, when I was born again, my name was written in the book of life. I'd like to get it written somewhere else, not in Westminster Abbey. I've never been a competitive preacher. I don't think, care whether you think I'm the worst you've ever heard or the best. It won't move me either way. I say what God wants me to say. But I'd like to get my name written somewhere. Do you remember in the days <clears throat> when the Apostle Paul, he cast demons out of some people. Jesus did that. Everything that Jesus did, Paul did. <clears throat> and one day he cast demons out of a person. 
And do you remember the time when Jesus cast demons out of a man that had a legion of them in him? And if you take demons out of a person, you must put them somewhere. They can't live disembodied. They can't float in the air. They have to occupy something or somebody. And you remember that Jesus took a legion of demons out of, the, out of a man. And if you think pigs aren't smarter than men, tell me this. When they put the, the demons in, they committed suicide in about 40 seconds. The man had had the devil in his ears. He wasn't smart enough to commit suicide or bad enough. But the pigs will leave by the devil. And, and hell is so bad, the demons said, don't send us back from whence we came. Now, one man one day said, I'm not getting on. I'd like to be famous. I'd like to do something. And somebody said, you find a man with a demon in. Cast the demon out. This is what you do. You say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, come out of him. The demon will come out. And the man tried it and it worked. <clears throat> the demon came out of the man. But he never sent the demon anywhere. So the demon turned around and he beat up the preacher. Kicked him, bruised him, and finally he came back and he said, Listen, pre pre preacher, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. Then who are you? I never heard of you. I think the most embarrassing thing of all the embarrassments, to quote Dr. Tozer again, I remember him saying to me one day, Len, not many of us are going to stand erect at the judgment seat of Christ with all our talk and all our boasting. Not many of us will lift our unblushing heads. Most of us will bow our heads in the presence of a holy God. <clears throat> I think the most terrible moment of trembling when we stand there alone without your pastor, without your wife, without your husband, you stand there as an individual. Remember, you've had as big a Bible as I have or anybody else that ever lived and you've given account to God for this word that he gave you. <clears throat> the most embarrassing thing will be when God calls Satan to bear witness. I wonder, I wonder what he'll say. I wonder if he'll say, Jesus I know and Paul I know and Rachel I know. Do you know? Will he say he knows you? Did you ever draw a line and take your rights in Jesus Christ and draw a line by the precious blood and then put the promises of God against it and the power of the Spirit and say, Yes, Satan, you shall not pass that line. When I was a boy in the little church I attended in England, they used to talk a great deal about Pastor Fettler of Latvia. Latvia got absorbed in the United States of Soviet Russia. They used to talk to some degree about a German, Pastor Blumhart. Bloomhart was reading the Word of God one day. He read that terrible statement. You see, we're always asking God to do something. God says, do it yourself. We say, Lord, tie up the powers of Satan. And Jesus says, listen, I gave you power over all the power of the enemy. And they sent to Bloomhart and said, there's a girl down the road there. She's demon possessed. She sits up in bed, she'll tear her clothes, pull her hair, she uses the most obscene language, she, she vomits some green stuff out of her mouth, and she's the most terrible person we've ever met. And he went along, he stood over that girl and demanded her deliverance and nothing happened. He went to second bed like that, she was delivered. He became famous for casting out demons. One day they asked him to go to a girl many miles away, and he went. The girl sat up in bed and laughed and screamed the most devilish, hideous noises he'd ever heard in his life. And everything he, he said, the demon counteracted. And every time he said, you'll come out, the demon said, I won't. And every time he pled the blood of Jesus, the demon said some obscene things about Jesus Christ. Because a long story short, this man was so determined that he'd exercise his authority over all the power of it. And he went to that girl's bedroom eight hours a day for two years. Every day he had a woman sit outside of the bedroom so nobody could say there was anything wrong going on. And he defied that demon and the demon and all the demons in hell laughed at him. He took toll of his body, he would sweat, he would almost bleed. Well, the preacher said, why don't you give up? This girl's beyond hope. Well, you think it doesn't happen? Listen, I spent two years in the subculture of New York with David Wilkerson editing his paper. 
I've seen some of the most beautiful girls in America. They used to sing in the choir and they could recite scriptures when I saw them. They could sing hymns without a hymn book. And they came to a thousand dollars a weekend. I remember a girl we had there demon possessed. She'd been to one of the great schools, Smith of Vassar. She had more culture and refinement and dignity than any girl I've seen practically. And she played around, acted with sex, acted with drugs. Demons got a hold of her. And one day as we talked to her, David Wilkerson said to her, said to her does, you, does your mother know you live this way? Where do you live? Oh, I don't live at home anymore. My mother's old-fashioned. You know, just wants to live at home with servants and cars and all the legwork. I've given that up. Where do you live? Anywhere. Who do you sleep with at night? Anybody. Black men, yellow men. You're a prostitute? Sometimes. I'm also a lesbian. I've taken drugs. I've been to hell and back. Wish my mother could get liberated. A few weeks after we were having breakfast with a bunch of cutthroats and murderers and jailbirds and prostitutes and the vilest of the vile. One boy leaned over the breakfast table and he said, Oh, you know that kid that's in that film that Ray Mill and uh, David Wilkerson interviewed? Mm -hmm. And she went berserk in a, in a coffee house the other night, somewhere down 111th Street. Boy, she thought even the cops couldn't control her. Finally, they tied her up with the belt. She's in the nut house. A few weeks after, the boys were talking again. They said, you know that kid that went to the nut house? She's come out. We saw down phone so the other night. She looks a bit weird. It's strange. A few weeks after we were having breakfast, one of the boys said, you know that kid that went to the nut house and got out? Mm hmm Oh, she was a she was a charming girl. Oh, she could show a jewelry and she could pose. She had the most amazing eyes. She would culture. Oh, she could quote Latin and French and all the stuff. Oh, she was some doll. Well, what about her? They pulled her body out of the East River last night. She didn't need help. She got personality, culture. Think she was going to be... I never found a prostitute that was going to be a prostitute anyhow. I could show you new girls in New York tonight that look like the Queen of Sheba. They're dripping with diamonds and they tell the earth that you don't have to uh, approach them. They'll approach you sitting in any hotel in New York. Go to the American on 8th Avenue. Go to some of the super hotels. Some pretty girl come up the side of you, tell her a price, and before you know she'll follow you to bed if you don't chase her. But I'll tell you this, there's not one of those girls when she comes home at three or four o'clock in the morning that doesn't cry herself to sleep and call herself the dirtiest dog in the country. Let me tell you just this other thing. I went in the office one day, here's a tall boy like a bean pole. He had a girl with stringy, dirty hair. Her nose was eaten away with drugs. Her teeth were all taken. Her eyes were hollow. Her temples were in. And I said, hi, can I help you? <clears throat> I don't want to help, help her. Help my wife. She's just on drugs. She's going to die. Is this your wife? No. Well, we've lived together three years. She's not my wife. But I gave her the first shot. And she's hooked, she can't get off it, we can't get the money. And he lolled there with his big, snaky looking eyes and they stunk the pair of them like a pole cat. What are you going to do? Pray. Pray? She needs something more than prayer, she needs help, she needs a doctor. You need to get her in an institution, she's going to die. We don't have any doctors. What can we do? 
Well, there's one thing you can't live together here. She can go in the girls' room over there, you'll go upstairs to a boys' room and we'll play. Two days after that girl walked in the prayer meeting. The picture of death. Wobbling, uh, sunken jaw, dirty, smelly, bleary eyes. She came out half an hour after as though she'd been to heaven and back. Her so-called husband was lulling up by the world. Hmm, half asleep. She came out. Triumphant. His nickname was Bunny. She said, Bunny, Bunny, it's happened. What's happened? I, I, I'm a new preacher. I just knelt down there and said, Jesus Christ, I'm rotten, I'm a sinner. I, I, I don't even know where you are. I don't know how to pray, but oh God, I'm in a mess. Don't know hell, I stood you back and go, will you do something? And somebody said, believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and ask him to come and cleanse your heart. And she did just that. And as quick as that, he changed her. Bunny said to me, will it last? Will it last? Will she die? I said, no, she'll live. Two days after, he went in the same prayer room. He came out just as transformed. I used to teach the staff there two mornings a week, Tuesday and Thursday. And he said, I, I, I'd like to come in every Tuesday and Thursday. I said, you get Mr. David Wilkerson's permission. You can come. He came. That boy now, that boy who was a despair to the police, despair to everybody. That boy who was eaten with drugs and devilry and dope and vice. He had lived with women. They'd lived all oh, the rottenest lives by our model. Yes, sir. Jesus Christ got hold of them and changed them. People said, you won't do much with them. They don't have any brains. I'll tell you what he did. That boy went to Bible school at the end of the first year. They asked him to leave because he was asking the professors questions they couldn't answer. He took Greek as extracurricular work. And his wife said, you know, it's amazing. We used to be out till two or three in the morning on drugs and dope that parties. And now there he is at two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning studying the Bible, getting a, a concordance, finding some Greek uh, wisdom, and, and he divides the word, devours the word of God. And you know what he's been doing for the last, what, three years now, I'm after, I guess? Four years, four years. That man has been hidden away in a little prayer retreat with a bunch of people soaking himself in the word of God. He was a despair to man, he was a despair to devil, he was a despair to everybody. But there came a day in his life when he said, look, I'm not going to play at Christianity. If Jesus Christ is going to think he's going to have everything. If you take this life of mine and cleanse it and organize it and quit me, he has me. What power do we have over the power of the devil? The greatest battle in the world is going on right now. The greatest battle in history was Gethsemane. <clears throat> the second greatest battle is going on now in the heavenly. And if America doesn't have revival, she'll rot in her own sin. And that goes for England too. I'll talk tomorrow night about revival and the price of revival. It's an awesome price, but it can be paid and revival can be had. You think that there's no power in prayer? You think there are not men who almost single-handedly can put barriers up and Satan cannot pass? Let me quote one. When the great plague was sweeping over Scotland about 1550, a Presbyterian minister got up one morning. He was reading the word of God. I give you power over all the power of the enemy. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will. Not he shall, not he could, not he might, he will. Put on his clerical collar, his three-quarter coat. And in the grey light of that awful morning, and I've been in Scotland in summer at four or five o'clock when you shiver even on a summer's day. At five o'clock he marched down the boundary line of the city and pushed, pushed and said, Satan, you shall not enter this city. Death, you shall not enter this Plague, you shall not enter this city. In the name of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost, I resist you. People opened their bedroom windows and looked and said, Oh, oh, it's the, it, it's the clergyman. Something must have gone wrong with him. He walked down the boundary line. He walked down the other boundary line. He couldn't walk down that boundary line because of the North Sea. And he couldn't walk down this because it was the River Tay. He walked down that boundary line and defied the devil while people laughed at him. 
The plague rolled on and rolled on and rolled on until it came to that boundary line. And everybody inside the boundary was saved and everybody outside of the boundary perished. You know why the devil keeps you so busy with trifles, little things? Because he's afraid you might discover the riches in Jesus Christ. That you have a right by yourself or with some other one to stand against the power of the enemy. But he doesn't run because you say boo, and he doesn't run because you pray for five minutes. It means getting together and declaring war on the powers of darkness. There's a lion in the way. Did that worry Samson? Did he, did he organize a committee? Did he suggest they got some weapons, swords? He went up in the strength of God and he tore the lion. The devil is devouring this age of the speed he's never devoured any other. There are more heathen people in the world tonight than any period in history. And this generation of Christians is responsible for this generation of heathens. I don't care if that heathen is a film star going into the world for a story dripping with diamonds or the people I saw there in the heart of Papua. My boys just come out of Papua. I've been there. They have walls of all dirt in the homes. This is not sunny. I got pictures of this, people say, don't show it anymore. There is a woman, they're naked anyhow, there's no sex appeal about them. And she has a baby on her breast, and there are pigs all over the house. And this little pig can't feed on its mother, so she rolls the baby on the floor and picks the pig up and feeds it. You go in another home, there's a woman suckling a dog, because the little puppy is sick, or its mother died. When you, saw, you see films like that, you don't say, oh, let's see them again, they're so funny. Isn't it appalling that a people 2,000 years after Jesus Christ came and they'd never heard that blessed name? Isn't it appalling that God has given us this book, the greatest treasure in the world, and we are, our feet are wet underneath, and the man waters to the ankles and knees, the loins, the waters are swimming, and the devil wants to keep us somehow occupied with lesser things. Because he knows that if he can move on, he's going to strangle our generations. I remind you tonight that two-thirds of the world right now is under the dominion of communism and the rest they're going. They're going to trap us as well. The answer isn't in politics. The answer isn't in finding out who's the uh, guilty party in the Watergate. The answer is, is the church of God and Jesus Christ going to revive? Is he going to put on the whole armor? Is she going to ask for this endowment to power from on high? Let me say this in case I forget tomorrow, that if perhaps if we were as spiritual as we think we are, you and I would have come to church tonight in sackcloth with a handful of ashes to put on our unworthy hands. Maybe the choice is simple. Either we concentrate in prayer or we pray in concentration camps. Which way do you want it? We've had our seven years of plenty. Most of you have a nicer home than the Queen of England. You've air conditioned everything. She has a big air conditioned house. The wind blows through it everywhere. You can turn the heat on. You can turn the cold on. Your children cry if you get Pepsi instead of getting the real coat. Poor darling. You don't have 28 varieties of ice cream and 28 varieties of donuts. Mother doesn't know what she's shopping for. I have an idea there are some bread lines coming up the road. But I won't talk about that. I'll talk to it tomorrow night. But I'll stay at home. There was a lion in the way. But he slew it. Go back just ten chapters briefly. <clears throat> ten chapters in this book of Judges. It's a lovely book, Judges, isn't it? Do you remember the other story there? We always tell the children these stories. The story of a little fellow, I think maybe 17 or 18 years of age. His name was... He was threshing corn. And while he was threshing it, an angel came. And the angel said, God is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. You know, if the angel had said that to me in the same circumstances I'm impudent, I would have said to the angel, so you tell jokes too, eh? God is with thee, thou mighty man of God. Just a minute, angel. You see that cave up there? That's where I live. You see the next cave? My uncle lives there. You, you know what? He said that Israel was in bondage. 
to the Midianites. And they never saw any supernatural manifestation. And you know, the greatest tragedy of our day is this. While your children may have seen rockets going up to the sky, and they know all about so much science, they know more science than the scientists knew a hundred years ago. What they learned at school, but they've never been in a Holy Ghost revival. They've never seen God come and put a fence around a community and plague that community. Smoke and men can't swear and men can't drink and men can't fish. God is with thee, thou magic. Wait a minute, God is with us. What am I up at night, at midnight, pressing corn for? I, I, I should do this at midday, but he didn't do it at midday. Why? Because they were in captivity to the Midianites. God the mighty man of valor. You know the answer? He said, if God be with us, where be his miracles that our fathers told us of? That would be a pretty stiff yardstick to measure most of our meetings with, wouldn't it? Where be his miracles? My, my, my grandfather told me that he remembers walking through the greatest uh, aquarium in the history of the world. They waved to the fishes as they went through when they were delivered through the Red Sea. He told me at night when he was nervous, he lived at the edge of the tent, and there was a fiery, cloudy pillar, the pillar of God's holy presence, higher. He told me he had a pair of shoes he wore for 40 years, they never wore out. He had a suit that he wore for 40 years, it never smelled. Every morning God opened the windows of heaven and sent the man and he spit a rock and water followed them. Those people lived on miracle, they ate miracle, they walked on miracle, they saw miracle, and yet they never entered the promised land. We've got thousands of people that will go thousands of miles to see miracles, but they don't want a life of holiness. They want to see God operate, but they don't want God to operate on them, do some divine surgery and circumcise their hearts and take away their evil spirit and take away their bad temper and take away their carnality that he might make them the dwelling place of his spirit. <clears throat> The book of Daniel is the book of Revelation of the Old Testament. Do you remember what God said when he gave Daniel the vision? He said, seal it up, it's not for today. When he gave John the vision in the New Testament, he said, don't seal it, it shall shortly come to pass, and that was 2,000 years ago. So he must be very near to the coming. But, God said to Daniel, in the last days, are we living in the last days? I don't think so. We're living in the last minutes of this dispensation, not the last days. But in Daniel it says, in the last days when wicked men do wickedly, the people that do know their God. Will you notice that? Not the people that know their Bibles. You can get Bible notes this high. You can know the Word of God without knowing the God of the Word. You may know the Word of God because you have that kind of mind. You like statistics and dividing chapters and penetrating words. You can be loaded with the Word of God and yet hardly know the God of the Word. The scripture says in the last days when wicked men do wickedly, not the people that don't know their Bibles, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploit. Are these the last days? Are wicked men doing wickedly? Let me uh, telescope history. In my day there have been three outstandingly wicked men. Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini. Forget Mussolini, forget Stalin, what about Hitler? He led from the coastline of Germany a thousand miles. He put more kings off their thrones than anybody else. Do you remember when he stood there with more machines and weapons and airplanes and tanks and devilish things than any man in history? And he raised his hand and he said, the Third Reich will live a thousand years. The Third Reich. The First Reich, you may or may not remember, was the Holy Roman Empire. When they built shrines to the Caesars, where if you wanted to save your life, you went to an image of Caesar and you put three grains of incense there and said, Caesar is God. And Hitler longed for the day when men would worship him and he said, the third right with his clenched fist will last a thousand years. It didn't last a thousand weeks. But he leant from the coastline of Germany a thousand miles. He pushed kings off their thrones. He said, I'll make Germany the master nation of the world and I'll pull the world to the edge of hell and he did that. 
then the world has never recovered financially from that time. I don't believe it ever will. When wicked men do wickedly. Oh, they've done it. He liquidated six million Jews. Read that marvellous book. It used to cost ten dollars. It's that thick. Fifteen hundred pages on the third right. One man! Not a man linked to God. A man that sold himself to the devil! He didn't go to bed at ten o'clock. Watch brainless Johnny Carson either. He read Napoleon. He was determined to be a greater military strategist than Napoleon himself. He went to bed at three and four o'clock in the morning after being guided by a spiritist medium who made every move for him correctly until the last one. And you can win battles, wars, and that's what he did. That little man who just had a Charlie Chaplin moustache on his lip and a stripe on his arm and everybody laughed and said, what will he do? He said, I'll conquer the world and they sneered at him. But he came within an ace of doing it. And if a man dedicated to evil, if a man dominated with selfish desire, can make America give its finest sons and rape Europe, If you fail to pay $30 income tax, they will send you to jail. But remember that world war from the last two wars. Russia owes America $1.5 billion. England owes America $11 billion. France owes America $7.5 billion. If you got that $20 million back, the dollar wouldn't be so sick. They'll harm you to jail if you don't pay your thirty dollars but we don't make nations do that we did not we're poor dupes aren't we they do what they want with us they've got us on a string we're puppets don't care whether you follow the democrats or the other crats or anybody else they've just got us where they want us we're not going to straighten this thing out economically socially financially the only way we can restore the balance in America is a purging Holy Ghost revival. Lends people from the politicians in the White House right down to the jail house and the brothel house and the ale house. <clears throat> All right, I'll tie it up. In the last days when wicked men do wickedly, you don't remember too much of Mussolini. I could tell you a lot I want. Stalin, but Hitler. And God says, when you see the devil put his supermen out, keep watching. I'm going to send my supermen. And he's going to send them as sure as that's my hand. I'm not sure he's going to Dallas Theological Seminary to get him, or even a Pentecostal seminary, but he's going to get his men. He always has. He always will. They got Samson. He's a menace. He embarrasses them. He lifts the gates of the city. He destroys their chosen men. He, he sets their stock of food on fire. He catches 600 foxes. Th this man you can't do again. Anything. The anointing is on him. And no weapon that is formed against him can prosper. And he was like that with the early church. All right. They got his secret. The woman said, you must be tired chasing foxes and lifting gates to the city. Put your head on my lap, have a, have a sweep. And he did. That must be the most expensive haircut in the world, I think. The next thing he hears is the same sweet, no, wicked lady saying, come on, wake up, Samson. The Philistines be upon me. And he woke from his sleep and he wasn't any smaller than when he went to sleep. He forgot to put his hair, hands up because they cut his hair off. He'd given his secret away. But he says, I'll go out as I did at other times. And here is one of the saddest texts in the Bible. He wist not that the Spirit of God had departed from him. He didn't know God had left him. A couple of simple things. In Cornell University a while ago, they did a very simple thing. They had an ordinary gas stove like you have at home. 
they put a dishpan of cold water here and a dishpan of cold water here and they lit the jets and they got this water boiling and they put a frog in it and suddenly he it was boiling as soon as he hit it he swore and he kicked and out he got he said if I stay here I'll cook to death they lit the jet on the other water at the very lowest point and two professors sat down and watched the frog for five minutes then they turned the jet up once and they sat down five minutes, they turned the jet up again and sat down five minutes, they turned the jet up again and sat down five minutes. And you know, if it got hotter, he wriggled and wriggled, but he adjusted and settled down. And it got hotter and... But he wriggled and he settled down. He adjusted. Except for the last time. And he just did. He didn't adjust the last time. When they drop the frog, frog in boiling water, he says, get out of here, I'll die. When they turned it up, just progressively, killed him all right. What killed your spiritual life? What killed your prayer life? What killed your Bible reading? Was it Johnny Carson? Was it your love for sport? What was it? Oh, Satan didn't get you drank, you didn't commit adultery, you didn't steal money from the business. You then, little by little, Satan turned the jets up and he got you exactly where he wanted you. All right, here we are, son. They got the man, they bind him, they blind him. They put him down in the basement, they put some bracelets of brass round his arm. They made him go round and round and round and round and round. Grinding corn for the Philistines. Are you going to suggest that if you got in that basement you wouldn't have heard that man crying? Don't you think he might have been saying rather angrily, God, why didn't I die after I slew that lion? Why didn't I die after I lifted the gates of, of the city? Why didn't I die after I did my exploits? I'm dying in misery and spiritual bankruptcy. <coughs> and while he's there, there's a... He turns his sight aside and says, Who art thou? I'm a boy. A kind of a boy. Philistine boy. A Philistine boy. What are you doing down here? I have come to take you. That must have been like a dagger in his heart. A time and a thousand men couldn't take him, and one boy is going to take him now by the fingers and take him away. Where are you taking me? I'm taking you into the temple of David and the fish god. They're having a conference. Everybody's saying, you know God is dead. Doesn't that sound familiar? The God of the children of Israel, he used to be the Lord, oh, he did miracles, but he's out of business, he, he died of old age. And we are the kings of the earth, our religion is the religion of the day. Where is the God of Israel? A man who could destroy a lion and destroy an army and lift the gates of a city, now he's taken by the fingers. And he says, son, steady, steady. Can you take me on the platform? Mm -hmm. Some steps up, but go cautiously. Now I'm blind. Do you know what it says? It says there were 3,000 men in the gallery. The gallery usually holds a third of the auditorium. So I'm going to guess there were 10,000 people there. And they bring Samson in and they laugh. Oh, that must have cut him to bits. They scorn, they say, the God of Israel is dead. The God of the Philistines is ruled. The God of sensuality, the God of lust, the God of materialism, the other God has gone out of business. And those sightless eyes began to feel tears and that heart that had been crushed for so long did something it hadn't done for a while. <laughs> for I don't care who the man is, I don't care how brilliant he is, how famous, how well he preaches, no man under God's heaven is greater than his prayer life. When Samson realized he was in this jam, the other he did, he says, Oh Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee, strengthen me just once. Is it amazing that while he believed in the God of Israel, he didn't say, Give me my eyes back now, chase the enemy. He didn't say, Take me back and make me one of the leading kings of the earth like I was. He didn't say, Give me liberty. Don't. I didn't pray for restoration. He was jealous of God. He says, God, will you please come? Stand with me once, whether I'm blind or not. I pray you in mercy, touch me. You know why I know he meant business? Because he says, 
strengthen me and touch me, verse 30 says, even if I die with the Philistine. And when a man can look up into the face of a holy God whose breath is in his nostrils and he knows God can stop his heart beating like that, and the next second he can be a corpse, and he says, God, I mean business so much that I want this anointing. I would rather live just a few hours with the anointing of God than live the rest of my life, blind and helpless and useless. Strengthen me, I pray thee, just once. God doesn't answer prayer. God answers desperate prayer. This man is more his life. He says, God, give me this anointing, even if I die. And that anointing came. And he pushed out the pillars and the house came down. And the word of God says he killed more in his dying than in his living. You know what we're going to have before long? The Holy Ghost revival. Do you know who the evangelists are going to be? Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men see visions, your old men dream, and on my servants and handmaids, not on my preachers and theological seminary professors, but on my servants and handmaids. That's what Jesus did when he started. He didn't go to Caiaphas and take him to the upper room. He went to fishermen, he went to tax gatherers, he went to poor men, and he trained them for three years and filled them with the Holy Ghost and sent them to turn the world up as it was in the beginning, even now it shall be in forever and forever. God's going to pour out his spirit. God's going to let this wicked, materialistic, sex-perverted, damned generation know he's God. Whatever the Philistines may say or do. He's looking for somebody that's desperate to get cleansed and filled with the Holy Ghost. My last word. If you live 365 days like you've lived the last 365 days, Will the devil have any worries about you? Will he know you're around? Is your life on the altar for everything that God wants to take out of it? Does anybody say, you know, I don't understand the secret of that man in our church. He's different from other men. He has more power. Oh, when he prays. He has authority. He can command unclean spirits to come out. We were in a, a place just the other night, a lady sent for me in a, in a hotel, Holiday Inn. The millionaires. She's got everything, but she was sick. She called my dear wife. Martha said, would you pray for Mrs. So-and-so? I said, yes. I went in the hotel and prayed for her. She said, I'm nearer death than I've ever been. She's had serious trouble. We went in and just simply laid hands on her and prayed. And came up. And we hit the road to come up here. She's gone back to the Bahamas, but her daughter-in-law was speaking to her. I tried to get by the radio. I tried to find him. I couldn't find him in Florida. I wanted to tell him that, that when he prayed that night, I woke up a new creature in the morning. The pain had gone. The sickness had gone. I was completely delivered. It's rather amazing. We have choirs. Well, that's all right. And we have choir leaders. That's fine. And we have education ministers. I wonder why we don't have a prayer minister. We've got bus ministers. I don't know how many more ministers are going to get in the church. Minister of the church, minister of music, minister of education, minister of busing. I wonder this afternoon as I meditated, why don't we have a, why don't we have a prayer minister? Is it because most of us have faith in prayer, but not many can pray the prayer of faith? Look, you forget everybody outside of this building. Forget your wife, your sweetheart, your friend right here. You want to come to spiritual maturity? You want to die like Samson, spiritually bankrupt? Or do you say tonight, Brother Rayfield, more than anything on God's earth tonight, I want to be cleansed and filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm prepared to challenge your holy God in the presence of this congregation. I'm prepared to pray Samson's prayer. Strengthen me, just once. If God will give me that anointing, I don't care whether I live six days or six years, but I want that anointing. Samson never lost it, he died with it. He died in the greatest revival he'd ever had. And you know we're going to have a Pentecost soon, but without Pentecost, Pentecost. God is looking for the men and the women. You know, if, that, if my program had gone around, we would either be in Australia or New Zealand tonight. 
at some of the greatest conventions in the world, and God said no. And I didn't know when your pastor asked me why I said to my sweetheart, darling, we're not going. I'd like to have gone to New Guinea to see our son and his wife and the children there. I'd like to have gone to these big conventions, there'll be hundreds of ministers, and God said no. And then they said, come to Merritt Island for one night, we stayed for. And then your good pastor said, well, if you're coming that way, why not come in? Now, I don't carry secrets, I'm just telling you this is how God orders things. So I don't know where you are, but I know I'm writing God's will tonight. I brought the message God wanted you to hear. And I'm not responsible for a single soul after this moment. There you pray, some of you 16 year olds, you could be God's anointed for the next generation. I don't think there'll be a generation. I don't think, I think Jesus will come within the next 10 years anyhow, maybe five. But he's going to shake the world before he comes. He's not coming for people. Who is he coming for? He's coming for a bride, not a widow. He's not coming for an old lady shuffling to the grave with bunions and cataracts on her eyes. He's coming for a young, beautiful bride, robed in white, robed in holiness, strength, strong, victorious. Are you hungering and thirsting for him tonight? As he looks at your shabby prayer life, as he looks at your past, as he looks at your dry eyes, as he looks at your lack of love for souls and concern for a lost world and for his coming. Our Father, we're glad that you look down from heaven at this moment. You remember a hymn that says, For those who have sought thee, thou never saidst no. There's not an angel or an archangel knows every heart, thou believe this moment, but you know every one of us. You know every grief over our failure, you know every obstruction that we've allowed to come in between a life fully, totally yielded to thee. A life dominated, controlled entirely by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray for each one of these dear ones here, if there are some unsaved, bring them into a conscious knowledge of this moment, of this moment of sin is forgiven. Who is a pardoning God like thee? Or who is grace so rich and free? But Lord, we believe that most of these know thee and, and the longing for that deep inner cleansing but the blood that this moment shall cleanse them through and through, and the Holy Spirit invade them from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. Lord, as we sing in this hymn this gorgeous, wonderful expression, until my heart is clean, purify every heart bowed before thee. Whether it be sin, whether it be doubt, whether it be fear, whatever it is, I pray just now, Heavenly Father, by the power of the Spirit and through the precious blood of Jesus, you cleanse every one of these hearts. But Lord, every person here at this moment will say, Come in, Holy Spirit. Take full control of my life. I pray thee tonight, Lord Jesus, get some bond slaves out of these people. Get some prayer warriors. Get some missionaries. Get some soul winners. Get some Sunday school teachers. Get people who from tonight shall know what it is to be constrained and restrained by the Holy Spirit. We're conscious of this desperate hour in which we live. We know that money cannot reach lost men and women. We know that human organization cannot do it. But oh God, we thank thee that all power is thine. And as you came on those men in the upper room, they were unlearned, they were ignorant, they had no prestige in the world, but when they came out, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they went out to bear fruit and bring glory to thy great name. I pray that homes will be transformed here. Homes that don't have a family altar, that come tonight, husband and wife will get together and read the word and pray. Those who have no passion for the lost will find tonight that tears of compassion come as those who are still in darkness and in the shadow of death. I pray for men whose lips have been sealed in the office where men tell dirty stories and they're arrogant in their sin that they'll have grace and power to testify, to witness boldly to the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the breathing of your spirit tonight. Lord, you said the evening and the morning were the first day. I beseech you in the name of Jesus, not for my sake, 
Now for the sake of this lovely church of Pastor Peter, Lord, that I ask for your glory, you start a fire here in this church that the whole community will know that God has come. That a fire will spread right through Florida and through America tonight with all its need, as needy as America is, as needy as England is, as needy as other countries are, that it will please me to make this house the birthplace and a revival that will shake this country for a holy God and save us not only from communism but save us from the devil and his power that will save our young people that will save the teenagers that will save the children in school give us expectant hearts bless us we pray in the morning sessions to meditate over thy word as we consider tomorrow night the mighty possibilities of being linked to a holy omnipotent God in prayer Oh, that thou wouldst this week rend the heavens and come down. Show us what it's like when God walks down the aisles, when God broods over the atmosphere, when God is allowed to have his way. Do that, Lord, which we will be conscious of as the power of God, not the work of the flesh, not the work of men, but the work, the mysterious, marvelous, miraculous work of the Holy Ghost. We covenant with you tonight that we'll give you every bit of the praise. We'll give you every bit of the glory. We say thank you for presencing yourself with us. Thank you for convicting us. Thank you for cleansing us. Thank you for purifying us. Thanking you for invading our personalities tonight with your spirit. May we go out in the power of the risen Son of God to live on an elevation of spirituality we've not known before. Dismiss us with thy blessing, we pray, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.